There is a wonderful connection between the graph coloring problem and topology, and we're going to see it today in this video. And it starts right here with this question about coloring maps. So let's jump in. If I have a map, so I've drawn a map here, some kind of area, and uh, the map coloring problem would be I want to color in these regions. I mean, I'll call this one red and this one red and this one red and I need some more colors. Uh, how about blue? Do I have a blue? Let's do this one blue and blue. And my goal in the coloring is that I, I don't want to put two regions which are adjacent or touching. I don't want to give them the same color. All right, this is a classic problem. I guess I can leave one of the colors and call it white. And uh, there we go. And so I've managed to do it with four colors here. And I don't know if I could have done it with three or two. So if you want to look at this example some more and try to find maybe a, a coloring with fewer colors, you could do it. Now, instead though, before we try to do optimization, let's write down what we really mean by this map coloring problem. Because superficially, it feels like the graph coloring problem, where I'm assigning colors to things and adjacent things should have different colors. But what exactly are those things and what exactly is the graph? So uh, I want to assign colors to the regions here. And those regions, we know we actually have another name for those. Because if this is an embedding of a graph in black, then the regions are the faces of the embedding. Um, so I'm going to assign colors to the region so that, uh, I'll put this in quotes, we'll say exactly what it means in a second, adjacent regions have different colors. And we're going to really get a graph out of this. And really that means we're taking a map and we're going to turn it into a graph. In this case, the vertices are going to be the regions, and the edges are pairs of regions that share some common border. In fact, they're going to have to share some edge in common. It, we, we won't call them adjacent if they only touch at one vertex. So I can write this as follows. Um, to say that, oops, that U and W are adjacent. Share some edge. Okay, so this graph that we got from the map, we started with the map and uh, we constructed a graph. This is often called the dual graph. Um, I almost don't want to write it down here as the dual graph. Um, it is the technical term. Um, but if you look at what this operation did, it was actually taking a map and producing a graph. So it really took an embedding of a graph and gave us a graph. And this really is just a graph in our nice combinatorial sense of the word graph. Uh, so uh, let's, let's see at least what this, this does on this particular example. Okay, so I kind of pulled out the same map here. And I drew in a vertex for every region. And I drew an edge between two regions if they share some border. That is, if they share some edge in the boundary of the faces. So uh, this maybe gets a little convoluted if I pull it out here. One thing you might immediately notice is that it's planar. And you might ask, is it always going to be planar? The answer is, well, yes, it will be. But you also notice that uh, now it should be quite clear that a coloring of the map is just a coloring of this dual graph. I could have drawn somewhat weirder maps here. Let me draw a weirder map. What about this one? And if I did, you might have to ask, well, is what is exactly is the graph? Because uh, these two are adjacent, these two are adjacent, these two are adjacent, these two are adjacent, uh, these two are adjacent. And I might be tempted to, I also draw this one here, 
but I already have that edge. Right, I, that edge from if this is u and this is uh, w, I already have the edge from u to w up here, so I don't need to do it down here, even though they do share a different edge, a different bit of boundary over on the other side. Um, these kind of examples are going to be uh, motivating for us as we go forward. If I, if I allow myself some stranger kinds of regions, I might end up with a dual graph that's not planar. So here I had four regions and then I put a fifth region that touches all four of the other regions. So if I drew this as a graph, I would get A would be adjacent to B, C, and D, and also E. And similarly, B would be adjacent to all four other vertices. And in fact, the whole dual graph is isomorphic to K5. And if it's K5, then it's not planar. And so this is a case where the dual graph is not planar. But you'll also notice that this region D is not connected. So when I, when I added in E, I somehow broke D into two parts. And so D is not really a face. And so it's important that we really only consider maps where the regions that we're building the dual graph on are nice uh, faces of an embedded planar graph. In particular, they really just have to be connected. If the map is given as an embedded planar graph, in which case I think we would have not five but six vertices, we would have some other face over here in the dual graph, then that resulting dual graph would be planar. And we'll see that. Um, we're going to do it for the extreme case where we've added as many possible edges as as we could to the dual to the original graph to make it three connected and then show that even in that case the dual will be planar. So here is why I was hesitant to just call the dual of the embedding the dual graph because if something is a duality this word duality is important and I claim that dualities usually should go both ways that is it should be a kind of involution. So if I can get uh, from a graph to a graph by some duality, if I, should, if I can apply that duality again, I should get back to where I started. That's, a, that's called an involution. Like an operation that you apply twice and you get back to where you started is an involution. And uh, if, we, if we think of duality as going from embeddings to graphs, then we lose this because clearly we just have different kinds of objects on both sides. and if we had started with an embedding and we get a graph from that graph, we don't necessarily get back to an embedding S or even know how to just define the dual for it, except for one important case. So if G is planar and three connected, then uh, we can do a little bit more because remember, if we have a planar three connected graph, then the set of phase cycles is well defined. So I can talk about the faces of a three-connected planar graph even without an embedding. So let's say FG is the set of cycles of G. And I think of them as subgraphs, I guess, that bound faces. And we saw in a previous video that this is exactly the set of non-separating induced cycles. So if we have this set defined, we can define the dual of a three-connected planar graph in terms of those cycles. So rather than talking about the regions we got from an embedding, we could talk about the dual of the graph itself, where the vertices are exactly those faces, and the edges are pairs of faces, where again, the faces are cycle subgraphs that bound faces. So these are pairs of these such that uh, that they share some edge. Uh, in other words, the edge set of A intersect the edge set of B is non-empty. Okay, and I left this out, but this is obviously um, by definition of a graph, this has to be a an element of 
the faces choose two, so pairs of faces, pairs of these cycles. And so two cycles that share an edge that are adjacent. If they share more than one edge, uh, we'll have to look at that, but I think if they share more than one edge, they're, um, the graph isn't actually three connected. So the first thing we want to check is that this operation takes us from planar graphs to planar graphs. And here's how you see it. If I take the graph G, you take this embedding of G, so it's a planar graph, I've subdivided all of the edges. So there's a new vertex on each edge. Each edge has been replaced with a path of length two. And from this now subdivided graph, I'm also going to add a vertex in every face. Now for three connected planar graphs, all these uh, face, faces are bounded by polygons. And so those polygons, you can just draw edges from a point inside the polygon to each of the edges. And these are disjoint paths here. So I'm going to draw these edges. And what I'll get from this, this subdivision and edge adding is a new graph plus one vertex here that connects to everything else. I won't draw all these edges. It makes it a real mess, but pretend they get out there. This new graph has this kind of interesting property. Let's call it H. And you can see that the dual graph, G star, is a topological minor, let me write it like this, of H. That is, H contains a subdivision of the dual, and H also contains a subdivision of G. This graph H, as we've drawn it, it's planar. It contains subdivisions of both G and its dual. And since H is planar, any topological minor of H is also planar. So we get that G star is planar. That's step one. The next step we want to show that if G is planar and three connected, then the dual G star is also three connected. The proof will be by contradiction. So suppose not, suppose that G star is not three connected. That means there's a cut size of, well, there's a cut of size at most two. And so let's say A and B are a cut set in G star. That means that there are these regions, A and B, and then there that have uh, some way of separating some region C from some other region D. So I have no path that can get me from C to D that doesn't pass through A and B. That means if there's no path, there has to be some Jordan curve that has C on one side and D on the other side. So let's just right, maybe we'll put C on the inside and D on the outside. And moreover, that Jordan curve has to be in the union of the faces of A and B plus any edges between them. Because if I remove those A and B from the graph, I'm going to remove this entire Jordan curve, which will give me the separation between C and D. So A and B. So I ha must have a picture that looks something like this. Right? I must have a Jordan curve contained in A and B plus the edges between those two and the region C has to be on one side and the region D on the other side. Right? So this is what my drawing of G should look like. If A and B share more than one edge on their boundaries, then G itself could not have been three connected. So that was one of our main hypotheses here is we assumed that G was three connected and we wanted to prove that G star was going to be three connected. So there can't be more than, uh, more than one edge. And now we can see that if you take this path, if this path 
passes through an edge more than once, then you can make a shorter path that goes through it only once. And so now you have a, a Jordan curve which enters, it starts at A, goes into B, comes back to A because it's a, a cycle, and it has to only pass through each edge at most once. So it must pass through at least two edges. So if it passes through two edges, um, then that gives us a cut in uh, the original graph G. So for example, in this case, if I were to remove these two vertices, I would separate the graph G because I would have vertices along this cycle C that couldn't get to any vertices in the cycle D. So that's the idea. So I'll just highlight this. I'll call this a proof sketch. And you can work through the details a little bit more on your own. So as a recap, if we have G, a planar three connected graph, we have a well-defined dual, even without an embedding. And that dual, which we call G star, is also planar and three connected. Now it remains for you to prove that the dual of the dual is, gets you back to the primal. So if G again is planar and three connected, then G star star is, I'll be careful about this, is isomorphic to G. So up to isomorphism, it gets you back to the same graph. The vertex set of the dual of the dual will be a set of cycles, um, but those cycles here will be in bijection with the vertices of G. And I'll give you a little hint. If you were to go back to this crazy construction, uh, you will find that the, the roles of G and H are uh, reversible, and this is really the key to proving this. But I'll leave that as an exercise. It's too fun uh, for you to just watch me do it.